Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. It's great to see you this morning. Great to be with you. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Is Jim actually in the room? Uh, I'm actually in the room. So if you weren't here last Sunday, uh, I wasn't here in the room. I had COVID, but I pre-filmed the message the Thursday before the Sunday. I stood up here and filmed it here. And so uh, I get three minutes into the message or actually showing a video. And then I stop in the video and say, how many of you in this room realize I'm not in the room? And about half of the room didn't realize I wasn't here because uh, we tend to watch those screens uh, over there. And so I wasn't here, but I hear it was really funny. And uh, I was laughing at you at, uh, from home. <laughs> um, I had, for the first time in three and a half years, I had COVID. Uh, my wife almost turned me into a laboratory. She's had COVID three times uh, over the last three years, and I've never gotten it. And she was going to turn me in for a science experiment. And, um, but then I finally got it. And uh, I had it for two, you know, about two days I had symptoms, and then I was fine. And so, but I went ahead and stayed. I did the whole uh, CDC five days uh, uh, isolating, and, but I'm fine, 100% back. Good to be with you. Enough about all that. Let's study God's Word. If you look at page three of your worship guide, uh, you'll find some sermon notes there. encourage you to get a pen out, get ready to take some notes. Or you can download the Grace Fellowship app and do the sermon notes digitally there. You can even fill in the blanks digitally there and then send the notes to yourself digitally if you want to, whatever works uh, for you. And then if you've got a Bible, turn with me in your Bible to the book of James. That's New Testament. Almost at the very end of your Bible, about 95% of the way through your Bible, after the book of Hebrews, you'll find James. We're going to look at James chapter 1. So I'm curious this morning, what would you say is the most important thing about a person? What would you say is the most important thing about a person? I decided to get online and kind of Google that and see what the internet world out there thinks is the most important thing about a person. I found some really interesting answers and I just began to tally them up and I concluded based on the internet that the world thinks the most important thing about a person is their education. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, and hey, I'm a big fan of education. My daughter's a teacher. I've got some degrees. But I am convinced that the amount of education a person has is not the most important thing about them. Other things that I heard the internet world saying were the most important thing about a person. Some people said uh, as a person's goals. Other people said uh, hard work, friendship, family, health. Somebody, uh, several people said entertainment is the most important thing about a person. Somebody said sleep. Uh, somebody else said uh, self-confidence. Now, I wouldn't debate that many of those things are important, especially family and friends. But the most important thing? And, and some people were saying entertainment. Like, come on. Entertainment is the most important thing about a person? <laughs> I, I saw a news article coming out of t- the nation of Turkey Uh, showing a news story of 1,500 sheep that went over a cliff. I was really intrigued by this story. So I read the details, and the shepherds said that it all started with one sheep going over the edge of the cliff. And then a second sheep followed that sheep over the edge. And then a third sheep followed that sheep over the And then a fourth, and then a dozen, and then dozens. And before long, 1,500 sheep had gone over a cliff. Now, all 1,500 of them would have died, except after about the first 400, it provided a landing pad uh, of soft wool. Uh, And so uh, the first 400 sheep died, and then the next 1,100 actually uh, survived. I thought, oh my word, oh Grace Fellowship, let's not be like those sheep. If the rest of the world is saying entertainment is the most important thing about a person, let's not go over that cliff uh, with them. Entertainment is not the most important thing about a person. I've concluded that the most important thing about a person is their spiritual life. And a close second is their relational life. That's exactly what Jesus said. When somebody asked Jesus, what's the most important thing? Jesus said, love God and love people. Love God, love people. Those are the most important thing. A.W. Tozier homes in on that And he has this quote, and I put it in your notes, and I want you to look at it. He says, he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I think that dovetails with what Jesus is saying, because 
You're going to love God or not love God based on what you think about God. And so Tozer is saying the most important thing about us is what comes into our minds when we think about God. Because if what comes into your mind when you think about God is that God is mean and that he's unkind and that he's tyrannical, then you're not going to love that God. And so I think I agree with Tozer. The most important thing about us is what comes into our minds when we think about God. And that leads to either love for God or not love for God. And I would love, and we've actually done it twice in our history, to do a whole sermon series on the attributes of God. Just getting to know who God is and his character. But if I could pick just one of the attributes of God, I would choose the goodness of God. What comes into your mind, in my mind, when we think about the goodness of God will determine whether or not we love God uh, or not. And so I just want to ask you a really simple question. Do you think God is good? Now, of course, all of us with our mouths are going to say, yeah, I think God is good. Uh, and when we do that, we're saying our theology. But I want to invite you to answer this question. Do you think God is good? Not just with your theology, but with your neology. What's the difference? Look in your notes. I put the difference. Theology is what you believe in your head. Neology is what you believe in your heart. Theology is what comes out in sentences. Neology is what comes out when you draw pictures. Draw me a picture of God. Theology is what you say. Neology is what you pray when you're on your knees. There's two things I've been thinking about all summer long. One is the life of John the Baptist. I've just been mesmerized with his life. And that's what I talked to you about last week. The other thing I've been thinking about all summer long is the goodness of God and, 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 and our neology. Uh, and our, does, it line, does our theology line up with our neology? Because what we think about the goodness of God is going to determine whether or not we trust him whether or not we pray to him, whether or not we want to become like him, whether or not we share him with others. And so I'm just convinced for my life, and I've just been dying to share this with you, for our lives, that our understanding of the goodness of God is crucial for our lives. It's one of the most important things about us. So that's where I want to take us this morning. Anybody want to go there with me? Anybody up for this journey? All right, let's do it. So I think there's no better person to look to to talk to us about the goodness of God than James. So the apostles uh, nicknamed James Camel Knees. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, James prayed so much, says history. James prayed so much that he developed knots on his knees and his friends called him camel knees because his knees kind of looked gross because he had knots all over him from praying all the time. You and I have got something to learn from old camel knees about the goodness of God. So let's say a prayer and then we're going to dive into James chapter 1 together. Let's pray. And if you've got a Bible, I just invite you to hold your Bible up in the air. This is a symbol of submitting yourself to God and to his word. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, change my life through your word. Do whatever you want. Amen. All right, here we go. James chapter 1, starting in verse 16. What does camel knees have to say about the goodness of God? Verse 16. The Bible says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So look at your notes. Let me walk you through Camel Knee's message to us about the goodness of God. And message number one is this. Don't let suffering deceive you into thinking that God is not good. So the first fill in the blank there in your notes is the word deceive. Don't let suffering deceive you into thinking that God is not good. Our tendency is to begin to doubt the goodness of God when we see suffering. And, and it's interesting mainly when we see it in other people's lives. But James exhorts us with great love not to be deceived into that kind of thinking. Notice the deep term of endearment he uses in verse 16. He calls us beloved. Look at verse 16. He says, Do not be deceived, 
my beloved brothers and sisters. The word there for deceived means to roam from the truth, to err, to go astray, to be seduced in our thinking. So what is it that James is afraid we might be deceived about? Well, this is just Bible study methods. You just look at the verses preceding it, and in verses 13 through 15, he's telling us what he doesn't want us to be deceived about. So he says verses 13 through 15, and he says, now don't be deceived about that. So look at verse 13. Go back up to verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So, beloved, do not be deceived into thinking that God is cruel and he's trying to trick us. Let no one deceive us into thinking that God is mean, beloved. Look at what Alistair Begg says about this. I put this in your notes. Begg says, God is never the source of evil, but is always the source of good. Philip Yancey tells a story uh, of a phone call he got when Princess Diana died in that automobile crash. You remember the automobile crash? She was, her chauffeur was speeding through a tunnel trying to get away from the paparazzi. You remember that? Listen to what Yancey says. He says, when Princess Diana died in an automobile crash, I got a phone call from a television producer. Can you appear on our show, he asked. We want you to explain how God could possibly allow such a terrible accident. Without thinking, I replied, could it have had something to do with a drunk driver going 90 miles per hour in a narrow tunnel? (laughs) I could not make their television appearance, but his question prompted me to dig out a file folder in which I had stashed notes of things for which God gets blamed. Things for which God gets blamed. In the folder, I found a quote from boxer Ray Boom Boom Mancini, who had just killed a Korean boxing opponent with a hard right. At a press conference after the Korean boxer's death, Mancini said, sometimes I wonder why God does the things he does. In a letter to Dr. James Dobson, a young woman asked this anguished question. Four years ago, I was dating a man and became pregnant. I was devastated. I asked God, God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? Susan Smith, the South Carolina mother who pushed her two sons in a car into a lake to drown them, wrote in her official confession, I dropped to the lowest point when I allowed my children to go down that ramp in the car in the water without me. I took off running and screaming, oh God, oh God, no, what have I done? God, why did you allow this to happen? Yancey says, Exactly what role did God play in a boxer plummeting his opponent to death? Exactly what role did God play in a teenage couple losing control in the back seat? Exactly what role did God play in a mother drowning her own children? I wonder, did God arrange these incidences as tests of faith? Yancey says to the contrary. I've seen them as spectacular demonstrations of human freedom exercised on a fallen planet. I can't tell you how important it is that we think rightly about God. I mean, who wants to worship a God who drowns children? Who wants to follow a God who drowns children? God didn't drown those children. Susan Smith did. Next to family of origin issues, I believe that a wrong theology of suffering is the number one contributor to wrong thoughts about God's character that cause us to doubt God's goodness. I'm going deep with us here, but this is crucial, I think. So it's crucial for us to have a correct theology of suffering and the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God. Um, Randy Alcorn, I think, does a good job of summarizing the scriptures on this. So look at the Randy Alcorn quote here in your notes. Look at this. He says, God's sovereignty is the biblical teaching that all things remain under God's rule and nothing happens without either his direction or permission. God works in all things for the good of his children. 
These all things include evil and suffering. God does not commit moral evil. Just underline that. God does not commit moral evil. But he can use any evil that somebody does for his good purposes. Ephesians 1.11 says that God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything is comprehensive, allowing for no exceptions. God works even in those things that are done against his moral will to bring them into conformity with his purpose and according to his plan. God can and will redeem the worst thing that ever happens to one of his children. That's good. Rick Warren says it this way. He says, nothing happens without God's permission, but not everything is God's will. God does not do evil nor tempt evil. And we're going deep here, but I want you to think deeply on this. This is so important. A.W. Tozer shares an illustration that's been helpful to me over the years. So let me share it with you. He says, all this that we're talking about here, imagine as an analogy that there's a cruise ship that's carrying passengers from New York City to London, England. The captain of this ship has predetermined that this ship is going from New York to London. Nothing can change that. Nothing can stop that. That being said, the passengers on board that cruise ship have complete freedom to do whatever they want on the ship. They can eat dinner in the dining room. They can play shuffleboard. They can play cards. They can read a book. They can go swimming in the ship's pool. They can take a nap. They can work. They can even jump overboard if they want to. But none of that will change the fact that the captain is taking his boat to London. Now, with that as an illustration, let's look at three different types of God's will. This is helpful to me. Maybe it's helpful to you. Type number one, God's sovereign will. This is the providential will of God that cannot be thwarted. God is taking the boat from New York to London. God's sovereign will cannot be stopped. God's circumstantial will. Circumstances that God allows in the midst of an evil, sin-filled, fallen world and through which God providentially takes and brings ultimate good and ultimate glory out of. The captain has given the passengers freedom on board his ship. He allows freedom. And some of the passengers choose in their freedom to do bad things. But God is so sovereign. He's so sovereign that he can even take the bad things that some of his passengers do and he can bring ultimate good out of those. Type of God's will number three, God's commanded will. What God commands us to do, but what many of us don't do. It is God's will that we obey his commands, but we do not always obey. The captain has rules for his ship, but people do not always obey those rules, and there's consequences when they don't. Of course, one of the classic Bible verses that sums up all that we're talking about here with the goodness of God and the sovereignty of God and the fallenness of humans is Romans 8, 28. You know this verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I love the line in the Corey Asbury song that we sing around here, uh, My Father's House, where in, in that song, he says this. He says, if... The story isn't over if the story isn't good. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. That's Romans 8, 28 right there. The story isn't over if the story isn't good. And then Torrin Wells has a similar line in one of his songs where he says, if it's not good, then God's not done. That's Romans 8, 28 right there. If it's not good, then God's not done. And sometimes, sometimes we get to see that good with our eyes here on planet Earth. And sometimes it's not till we die and go to heaven that we're able to have the eyes to see and the knowledge to see the ultimate good that God was bringing. My favorite C.S. Lewis quote, He talks about the first words that are going to come out of our mouths when we get to heaven 
are going to be the words, of course. Like, you die, you see the light, you go to heaven. The first words out of your mouth as you enter into heaven, all of a sudden you're going to understand everything. And you go, of course. I didn't understand it while I was on planet Earth. But now that I'm in heaven, I can see and know, of course. Of course. Beloved, don't be deceived into thinking that God is not good. He is a good, good, good father. Number two. Big number two uh, that we can learn from old camel knees in James chapter one is that all of God's gifts proclaim to us his goodness. So the next fill in the blank there in your notes is the word gifts. All of God's gifts proclaim to us his goodness. Look again at James chapter one, verse 17, verse 16. Beloved, don't be deceived into thinking that God is cruel, not kind. Rather, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. One of the ways that we know that God is good is by looking at his gifts to us. And the scriptures are just full of this. So look at the scriptures I put here in your notes. Just tons of scriptures. Matthew 7. Jesus says, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Psalm 33. The earth is full of the goodness of God. What's the earth full of? It's full of mountains and rivers and snow and trees. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Psalm 107. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord. Why? For his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Psalm 106. Give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Like taste food and go, oh, God gave me this. This is good. See things, see mountains and know that God is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And then John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So I just want to invite us to slow down for a minute and meditate on all the gifts all around us that we can taste and see. Uh, that show us that God is good. So let's just meditate on some of these. So think about some of God's good and perfect gifts. Think with me about sunrises and sunsets. So we got some pictures of those. Just look at those. Isn't that pretty? God is the greatest artist who was, ever was, ever will be. And every single day, God paints a gorgeous and unique picture with us with every sunrise and every sunset. Have you ever just paused and looked at the sky in wonderment and amazement of a beautiful sunset, a beautiful sunrise? I find it mesmerizing. It is a good and perfect gift. Or think with me about mountains for a moment. We got some pictures of mountains. Just look at those mountains. Have you ever just stared at the mountains? They're amazing. They're majestic. They're beautiful. Mountains are a good and perfect gift from above. Just look at them. Think with me for a moment about butterflies. We got some pictures of butterflies. How in the world did God ever think of butterflies? Like they're the amazing creatures who used to be caterpillars and then they're transformed to these beautiful winged creatures. Butterflies are a good and perfect gift from above. Think with me about food, like watermelon. Look at that picture of watermelon. This is Oh, it tastes so good. And it's just beautiful. And it's just sweet in your mouth. It's just a good gift from God. Or carrots. Look at carrots. I mean, they're just pretty. Look at them. And they taste good. They're really good on a salad. And then bread. Oh, wow. Bread is so good. Every good and perfect gift is from above. This is from your Father above. It's just so good. And I could just go on and on. I mean, God gives us oxygen, and he gives us trees, and he gives us birds, and he gives us rivers, and he gives us all the people in our lives. I just want to spend the next 30 minutes to show you pictures of my grandchildren. That's all we're going to look at for 30 minutes is a picture of my grandchildren. He says, these are gifts from God. And God gives us his word. The Bible is his gift to us and his spirit. 
And he gives us his church. And he gives us spiritual gifts. But hands down, the greatest gift that God has given to us is his son, his only son, Jesus. The greatest expression of the goodness of God is the gift of his son. And specifically, he didn't just give us his son. He literally sacrificed his son in our place as our stead who would receive our punishment for the punishment we deserve for our sins. He pours out that wrath on his son in our place out of goodness and love for us. It's, it's his greatest gift. You know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life with God. He's so good to us. And Jesus on the cross is his greatest expression of his goodness. Watch this short video about John 3.16. Watch this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 is for the whoever's. Wherever you came from, whatever you've done, and whoever you are, I want you to know that according to John 3.16, right now you have an arms wide open welcome from God. Anybody, everybody, anywhere, whoever. John 3.16 isn't just for kids. It's for hurting mothers, broken fathers, and all of us. It isn't just for t-shirts and tattoos and bumper stickers and bookmarks. Because John 3.16 is not a decoration. It's a declaration. John 3.16 is an invitation to redemption, reconciliation, forgiveness, and eternal life. John 3.16 reminds us that the story of God isn't about a few special people making it up to God, but God making his way down to the rest of us, to the whoever's. John 3.16 is what God thinks about you. You are loved, welcomed, valued, seen, and you are invited. You are not half-loved, you are not unseen, and you are not forgotten. John 3.16 is for the whoever's. John 3.16 is for you. John 3.16 is for me. The greatest expression of God's goodness is his son on the cross. All right, number three. A third thing we can learn from old camel knees about the goodness of God is number three. God is always good. He does not change. So always is the last fill in the blank there in your notes. God is always good. He does not change. Look again at James chapter 1, verse 16. Beloved, do not be deceived into thinking that God is cruel and that he's twisting you. Instead, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, here it is, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The fancy theological term for God not changing is the word immutable. Look at what A.W. Tozier says about this. He says, since God is immutable, he never varies in the intensity of his loving kindness. He's never been kinder than he is now, nor will he ever be less kind. God is not like some fickle, moody human being where you're never certain what mood you might catch that person in. No, God is consistently and unchangingly good. As Maxie Dunham says, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And God's goodness is not based on your goodness. <laughs> that's, that's actually the gospel. You don't earn God's goodness by being good. The truth is, none of us are good. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
None of us deserve the goodness of God. And yet in his mercy and love and his grace, he pours out his goodness on us. And Jesus Christ does the divine exchange where he takes all of his goodness and places it on us in exchange for all of our badness, which he takes upon himself on the cross. That's the gospel. God's goodness to you is not based on your goodness. It's based on his. That's the gospel. All right, that's the whole message this morning. And now the only question is, how are you going to apply it to your life? How are you going to make it personal to your life? Let me make some suggestions on how to make this personal. So look at your notes. Suggestion number one, pray for eyes to see God's goodness. Pray, Lord, please open my eyes to your goodness. Three stories uh, on this. The first happened in 800 BC. Elisha's servant, Gehazi, goes out in the morning to get the newspaper off the sidewalk. And as he does, he looks up and there's the whole Syrian army that's come to kill Elijah. Like they sent a whole army to kill one man and they're all there surrounding Elijah's house. And so Gehazi, the servant, runs back inside. And he says, Elijah, Elijah, we're going to be killed. And Elijah prays a really simple prayer. He says, Lord, open Gehazi's eyes. And the Lord answers. And all of a sudden, Gehazi can see in the spiritual realm thousands and thousands and thousands of angels, uh, horses and chariots of fire protecting and surrounding them. Takes out an entire Syrian army. Example number two is in Genesis 21. We read of Ishmael's mother, Hagar, giving up hope as she thought she and her son were getting ready to die of thirst in the desert of Beersheba. And when Hagar cried out to God, the Bible says that God opened her eyes to see a well of water that was actually already there. Lord, open my eyes to see your goodness that's actually already there. The third example comes from Genesis 50. Joseph's brothers thought that he was going to seek revenge on them because earlier they had kidnapped him and sold him into slavery. But in one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, in Genesis 50, 20, Joseph says to his brothers, don't be afraid. Years ago, you intended to harm me, but when you sold me into slavery, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. I call this my 5020 vision verse. Genesis 5020. Like I want to have I don't want to have just 2020 vision. I want to have 5020 vision. I want to have a 5020 vision to be able to see the good, the ultimate good like Joseph did. Even in the midst of hard times to see the ultimate good that God is working. God give me 5020 vision. Pray for eyes to see God's goodness. A second suggested personal application of today's scripture is to choose uh, faith. Choose faith. Come to the prayer altar in just a couple minutes and kneel and and pray and say, Lord, I choose to trust you because you're good and you're worthy of my trust. And I put an example of a prayer here. You could just come to the prayer altar and pray, Lord, I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my salvation. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my bills and my finances and my job. God, I trust you with my marriage. I trust you with my singleness. I trust you with my sexuality. God, I trust you with my children, my health, my loved ones, my future, my circumstances, my everything. God, I trust you. Would you just go to your knees in a few minutes here and tell God you trust him by faith. A third application is imitation with the Holy Spirit's power. You can't do it in your own power. Say, I want to be like my heavenly father. I want to be and do good. Proper response to God's goodness is to imitate God's goodness in the power of his Holy Spirit. Another one of my favorite Bible verses is Micah 6, 8. But have you ever noticed the word good in Micah 6, 8? You know the scripture. Look at it in your notes. He has showed you, O man, what is good. There it is. And what does the Lord require of you? Well, because he's been good to you, he wants you to turn around and be good to others. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Because God has been good to me, I'm going to turn around and be good to others. Application number four is sharing my faith. I'm going to share the good news with as many people as I can. Two specific ways that I can recommend for you and I to do that, uh, even this week. 
One is invite somebody to church. Uh, next Sunday is a great Sunday to invite somebody to church. I mean, we've just thrown a softball lob to you. Uh, when you sat down this morning, hopefully you had one of these bookmarkers uh, in your seat. If you just grab that and look at it with me. So next Sunday, we're going to start a brand new sermon series called Book Club. We're going to do a six-week sermon series, six sermons, covering one per week, six different books of my favorite books about happiness, anxiety, boundaries, heaven, um, abiding in Christ, and a stud by the name of Hudson Taylor. And we're going to do one book per week. And uh, I'm going to give you a book summary of the book, but more than that, it's going to be a launching pad to just do a Bible study together uh, on the scriptures about happiness, the scriptures about anxiety, the scriptures about uh, boundaries, etc. And so it's, 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 I think it's going to be a great week to invite somebody. And so you could just, would you take this home, would you pray over this bookmark and say, God, will you do something in my life through the book club sermon series? God, will you do something in our lives? And God, who do you want me to invite to church? And he's going to bring somebody to your mind. And you can just take this bookmarker and walk up to somebody at work or to your neighbor or a relative and say, hey, our church is starting this really cool sermon series next week called Book Club. And I would love for you to join me. Uh, would you come to church with me and sit with me? And if you scan this QR code, it'll tell you a whole bunch more about what it's going to be about. I'm telling you, it's a softball love invite. Also, during the book club series, uh, we're going to cover these six different books over six weeks, book summary, Bible study. Maybe you would consider picking one of the six books and grabbing some friends or family or your small group and saying, we're going to go deep in this one book while the whole church is getting an overview of all six books. And you get the book and then you do a six week to eight week deep dive in that book. That's what my small group uh, is doing. So next week, the first book is Max Lucado's How Happiness Happens. Let's let Max introduce the topic to us. Watch this. How long has it been since you felt the level of contagious, infectious, unflappable, unstoppable happiness? Well, if you're like most people, the answer is it's been a while. While everyone craves happiness and everyone benefits from it, the reality is that the majority of us can't find an adequate reason to check the yes box on a happiness questionnaire. In this study, we will look at the path that God lays out in His Word for finding true and lasting joy. And we will see that doing good really does do good for the doer. So join me on this journey, and together we will discover how to make happiness happen in our lives. So next Sunday, we'll dive into that. I'll take 12 scriptures from that book and we'll talk about happiness. The week after that, anxiety. Uh, so invite somebody to church. A second way to share your faith is through uh, Friend Speak, volunteering for Friend Speak. Uh, Friend Speak is an awesome thing that God's doing around here. You simply volunteer to help an international practice their English using the Gospel of Luke. It's genius. Watch this quick overview of Friends Speak. Watch this. In the recent years, we have seen a large population growth of the international group in the KD area. Many of these people are interested in improving their English. Friends Speak provide us a good opportunity to help our international neighbor to improve their English by reading together in the Gospel of Luke. Each week, a volunteer will meet with our students either physically or online via Zoom for a one-hour session in a one-to-one -one setting. The one hour is spent in participating in friendly and meaningful conversation while sowing the seeds of God's Word in the heart of international friends. If you have an hour a week and are open to making a new friend, you are perfect for friend speak. To find out more, visit friendspeak.net. So good. They obviously filmed that in the wintertime. <laughs> you see, like, wearing coats and scarves. and Yeah, that's not filmed this week. All right, one final suggestion for applying today's Bible verses 
uh, about the goodness of God, and that is gratitude. Gratitude. Choose to worship God with a thankful heart and to love, live a lifestyle of gratitude to God. Uh, the Bible says, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is good. And so one of my personal practices is on my phone. I just have a, uh, in my notes app, I just have one note that's titled my gratefulness journal. And two or three or four times a week, uh, while I'm exercising or I'm uh, waiting on something, I'll just enter into my gra- gratefulness journal, two or three or four or five things that I'm grateful about uh, that have happened over the last couple of days. And, uh, and it just, it wells up within me uh, about the goodness of God as I journal uh, about uh, his goodness. Watch this final video. Uh, watch this. The table is where life happens. It's where imagination runs wild. Where lessons are learned. And wonders are built. The table is where time can stop. Where wounds are comforted. And freedom begins. It's where we find peace. And we laugh till it hurts. The table is where we gather with family, new and old, to share stories. To nourish our bodies. To enrich our souls. The table is where we give thanks. And where we remember what great gifts we have been given. So I'd like to invite you to the table. Um, we use the word Eucharist sometimes to describe it. And the word Eucharist in Greek means thanksgiving. It's the table of thanksgiving. I wanna invite you to the table. I wanna ask our small group leaders and board members that are present, if you'd uh, come on up to the front or the midsection and help us get ready to take communion in just a couple of minutes. So small group leaders, if hey, if you're a student who leads a junior high group, you're a small group leader. Uh, board members, uh, come on up either to the front or if you're in the back, uh, come to the halfway point and, uh, and get the elements so we can be ready to take communion. Meanwhile, let me remind you what communion is all about. Uh, on that last night that Jesus was with, with his disciples, He took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to eat this in remembrance of me and and, and remember the goodness of God. Celebrate, be thankful for the goodness of God. And then Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this and remember me and give thanks for the goodness of God. So, Father, we pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit on this bread and this juice and make it holy for us in such a way that as we come and take communion, we'd actually be communing with you. We would be fellowshipping with you. We'd be encountering you with you. Lord, give us a, a supernatural encounter with you as we celebrate the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The invitation to take communion is open to anyone who calls on Jesus Christ. And if you've never called on Jesus Christ before, you can call on him right now in this room. Just right there in your seat, tell God um, that you're sorry for your sins, repent of your sins, and then invite Jesus Christ into your life. Receive his forgiveness of sins. Receive what he did on the cross uh, for you. And then you come uh, and take uh, communion. The Bible encourages us to confess our sins as we come and take communion. So uh, when you're in route, I encourage you just to confess any unconfessed sin to God uh, silently in in, in your prayer. And then how are we going to come? So I think we've got a diagram that we can put up there on the screen. Uh, 
So this is a little bit different than we've done in the past. We're going to give this a try, see if it works. The red dots represent everywhere where somebody's standing with bread and, and juice uh, for communion. The blue dot is actually up here, right here in front of me. It represents a gluten-free option here, blue dot, and the sealed option. So if that's what you want. But the red dot is where all of our small group leaders are standing, ready to serve you communion. And rather than, <laughs> we're just going to try it, rather than telling you a certain route to come, just go to one of the red dots. Pick any red dot you want to and go to the red dot. And don't worry about people flow. And maybe it's going to be a little bit chaotic. Maybe it won't be. We'll see. And if it doesn't work, we'll do something different uh, next time. But just go to the red dot closest to you. Go to these small group leaders standing along the wall or up here in the front or in the midsection that are closest to you. Then the prayer altar is open for you to come and pray. So come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come, take communion.